I'm also just thrilled to be here in Taos. Uh, I, I grew up in Albuquerque, and uh, my parents, uh, my mother is here, and my parents instilled in me a great love both for New Mexico history and New Mexico uh, just landscape and beauty. My father worked uh, at UNM during my elementary, junior high, and high school years, and we used to come sometimes out to the D.H. Lawrence Ranch and, and stay, and, and I just think that Taos is one of the most beautiful, beautiful um, places in the state. And it was just always a pleasure to drive up here. So I appreciate that, that opportunity. Um, so what a treat to talk about um, the revolt uh, tonight. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually say that I think that, that Robert Torres is absolutely correct that we should be celebrating as patriots um, those resistors to American occupation, but I'm also going to take um, Albert Gonzalez's side and say that I think we can take the revolt language or the rebellion language and we can make it our own and kind of re reclaim that. Again, it was a revolt to the American occupation. Um, uh, not a legitimate occupation at the time, during a time of war, and it's important to keep that context in mind. But, but how wonderful to hear your remarks, and, and I, think, I think we're gonna, gonna have some nice uh, synergies um, tonight. So my comments are primarily drawn from uh, my 2007 book, which Sylvia mentioned. Um, the captivating cover art, uh, since we are in house, I must say, is a painting by Ernest Blumenschein. Uh, it, was, it was titled Jury Trial, Jury for Trial of a Sheep Herder for Murder. Um, and he painted this in 1936 and he considered it his masterpiece. And the uh, adobe that you see is from his studio and you can see, uh, see that studio here um, down the block. Um, so my remarks are going to expand our conversation in several ways. Uh, for one, I will expand the geographic scope. Um, I want to talk not only about Taos, but also about the larger region and the nation as a whole. Additionally, I will expand our chronological focus um, from the 1846 to 1848 period, um, or from the 1830 to 1847 period up to the turn of the 20th century. And additionally, I'm bringing a different scholarly uh, approach uh, to this conversation. My academic training, as Sylvia mentioned, is in both sociology and law, and I have looked at these events, which I will be talking about tonight, from those perspectives. So, for example, um, I have been very interested in, in uh, and found very, very foundational and helpful Professor uh, uh, Dr. Torres's uh, groundbreaking work on uh, the 1847 uh, activities, and I've looked at some of the legal documents in particular of those. As a sociologist, I'm interested in the bigger, more abstract questions, um, what we call the macro perspective. And while some historians are interested in this kind of perspective, most are not. Um, David Montejano, who is a sociologist who also does historical work, um, has has really nicely and eloquently uh, framed uh, framed this, um, and I'll I'll just leave that up there for you to look on your own. But the point is is to look to be true both to the history, but to also be um, true to the his, the sociological enterprise, which is abstracting from that history. So a little bit of a roadmap. Um, I am going to talk um, about three. Um, three things. Um, the first Mexican Americans, the origins of New Mexico's tricultural myth, and then finally some concluding remarks on remembering and forgetting past traumas. Um, so let me now turn to my central argument. It is that Mexican Americans are a racial rather than an ethnic group, and that the 19th century history of New Mexico played a key role in the process of Mexican Americans becoming a racially subordinated group in the United States. 
the tendency is to think of Mexican Americans as an ethnic group. Um, the ethnic framed gained, gained prop popularity in sociology and in anthropology after World War II. It was a way for some scholars to distance themselves from the eugenics-fueled emphasis on biological race. Uh, the, the ethnic frame emphasizes cultural difference and immigrant origins, stressing that over time, over generations away from immigration, assimilation will occur. In contrast, the racial approach that I use emphasizes group conflict, discrimination, and hierarchies rooted in power differences among groups. Under the ethnic model, it was assumed that Mexican Americans were like white European immigrants and that over time they would assimilate. They would become more, they would become white like Italians, Irish, and Jews did um, over time. I'm happy to talk more about this in, in Q&A, but I, I contend that that has not happened. It hasn't even happened to the Mexicans of New Mexico who have some of the deepest roots in this country, right? Who didn't immigrate, in fact, um, to this country. Um, so why that is so, why Mexican Americans have not assimilated, I think has a great deal to do with this region's colonial legacy. And in Manifest Destinies, I theorized that the Southwest is a product of double colonization. I've argued that these two colonial experiences continue to shape today's racial dynamics. So what do I mean by that? The American colonization of the 19th century, so forcefully evident in the 1847 revolt and in the, the wonderful narrative that Robert gave us, um, was grafted on to the Spanish colonization of the 16th through the 19th centuries. Both regimes imposed a system of status inequality grounded in racial difference and an ideology of white supremacy, though the particular variants of the ideology of white supremacy differed under the two. Thus, the Anglo, Mexican, Pueblo, and other Indian people living in the Southwest at mid 19th century had to navigate two different racial regimes simultaneously, the Anglo-American racial order and the Spanish-Mexican racial order. I will significantly simplify a multi-layered argument about complex social processes, but the heart of it is that the two racial orders clashed, um, and especially here in New Mexico. Under the Spanish-Mexican racial order, the key racial categories were Spanish at the top, Indian in the middle and black at the bottom, with the caveat that the society was characterized by extensive racial mixture among those three groups, right? This is the mestizaje um, that we know exists. And of course, under the Spanish system, a Byzantine caste system um, described those various mixtures, right? That mestizaje. Under the Anglo American racial order, the key racial categories were Europeans on top, enslaved blacks at the bottom. Anglo-Americans' views about Indians were more varied from coexistence and nation-to-nation -nation relationships earlier on to genocidal policies, to intermarriage, to, to, genocidal, uh, to cultural genocide as well. Um, Americans' racist ideology ultimately served to, to legitimate different material goals with respect to blacks and Indians. For Indians, it justified the wholesale dispossession of their land, whereas for blacks, it justified exploiting their labor by treating them as property itself. Significantly, New Mexico's Pueblo communities are virtually the only indigenous peoples who kept their land, land grants that had been awarded under Spanish colonial rule and some, in some cases under Mexican rule. This had a great deal to do with the Spanish-Mexican racial regime under which Pueblo Ind Indians occupied a favored position relative to other Indians. Likewise, under American colonial rule, the quote unquote Pueblo problem confounded politicians and judges. The latter eventually allowing Pueblo Indians to keep their communal land grants, unlike Mexicans, who in large part lost their communal land grants. 
Tellingly, Pueblo Indians lost the political rights they had gained under Mexican independence in contrast to Mexican Americans who gained American citizenship, albeit a second class American citizenship. The US invasion of Mexico resulted in the massive land cession at the end of the war that would become all or parts of 11 US states. But what became of the people who were living in this vast territory? In particular, where did Mexicans fit in the American racial order? The Mexican treaty negotiators insisted on citizenship for its citizens, but this nearly scuttled the peace treaty. The American press and politicians in Washington, D.C. considered this the most controversial position, provision of the treaty because Mexicans were presumed to be inherently inferior racial mongrels and thus unfit for American citizenship. But the Mexicans won the citizenship, the citizenship battle even as they lost the war, and the first Mexican Americans were the 115,000 Mexicans living in that former northern Mexican territory. 115,000. And guess what? Two thirds of them lived in present day central and northern New Mexico. Two thirds of them. Only 23,000 lived in. in Texas, and only 14,000 lived in California. Two thirds of them lived here in New Mexico. New Mexico is the heart of this population of the first Mexican Americans. Why was New Mexico the most inhabited region? Largely due to the Pueblo peoples, I would contend, who made the region habitable for later mestizo settlers. And that was indeed part of the design of the Spanish colonial uh, process uh, system. OK, um, now I'm going to turn to origins of New Mexico's tricultural myth. In effect, two different logics about racial mixture govern the two colonial powers. Under the American racial order, the one drop rule governed black-white mixture, which under slavery was extensive. Black-white mixture was extensive. One drop of black blood led to racial classification as black, absent the ability of a particular individual to pass as white. But under the Spanish-Mexican rule, what I, I call the reverse one-drop rule existed. One drop of white blood got you to European status, along with some other wealth or, cur or, or um, currency of status, such as fair complexion. OK, so. OK, so what happened when these two racial logics uh, clashed into each other? One result was the myth of tricultural harmony that still holds sway in New Mexico. And let's look at two competing interpretations of the myth. So um, historian P Porter Stratton was writing in 1969 at the height of the US Civil Rights Movement and on the cusp of the Chicano, Chicano Movement. He said, three distinct cultures, Indian, Spanish, and Anglo, live peacefully and cooperatively in modern New Mexico. And then we have. Um, and, and he was not being ironic, right? right? He certainly doesn't think that this is myth. And many people today, maybe and uh, entirely possibly many people in this room, don't think that's myth. Professor Emerita Silvia Rodriguez, writing in 2001, took a different approach. She said, she wrote, the enduring and endearing cliche of New Mexico as tourist mecca is tricultural harmony. Rodriguez wrote about the rise of the tricultural myth during the New Deal period and its tremendous impact on New Mexico's arts and tourist industries. I would like to suggest that the roots of the tricultural myth go back even further to the late 19th century when it emerged as a counterforce to defend Mexican Americans against American racism. And just to give you a taste of that racism, and we've gotten a little bit, I think, from the earlier presentations, these are two New York Times front page headlines. Progress retarded by a want of energy, lazy Mexicans, the chief inhabitants. And then greasers as citizens, what sort of state New Mexico would make, the origin and character of the so-called Mexicans of that territory, their hatred of Americans, their dense ignorance, and total unfitness for citizenship, the women of New Mexico. He headlines were apparently longer than <laughs> they are today. Um, in the context of the virulent anti-Mexican racism in Congress, 
in the press and in day-to-day -day interactions with Anglos, New Mexico's Mexican Americans sought increasingly to distance themselves from Mexico and to instead align themselves with their Spanish ancestry. But this impulse would not have risen to the level of hegemonic ideology, as indicated by the persistence of this myth today, all these years later, unless Anglos had embraced the myth, or at least some Anglos, Anglos had embraced it. The fight for statehood offered the incentive for some Anglos to formulate an alternative to the anti-Mexican racism so blatant in these headlines. And perhaps fittingly, it would be a descendant of the Mayflower Pilgrims who led this battle, LeBaron Bradford Prince. Prince first came to New Mexico in 1879 as a presidentially appointed justice of the Territorial Supreme Court. And then 10 years later, a different president appointed him territorial governor. Prince was doubtful that New Mexico would ever be able to become a state if the New York Times wasn't rebutted. Because unlike Texas and California, Anglos remained a small minority in New Mexico. In 1882, his letter to the editor was published under the following headline. The people of New Mexico and their ter territory, the Honorable L. Bradford Prince finds much to admire in his new neighbors, the Spaniards of their territory and their qualities as citizens. Over the next two decades, Prince would further develop these ideas in his efforts to gain congressional approval for statehood. He repackaged New Mexico history to put Spanish and Mexican settlers on an equal footing with the English settlers of the original American colonies. This is one, one example of, of how he did this, writing in 1883. Our citizens are mainly the descendants of the two great nations which insisted on the rights of people in England under the Magna Carta and drove the Moors out of Spain that self-government should reign there. They are the children of the patriots who thought for the independence of the United States in 1776 and in Mexico from 1810 to 1821. Surely the sons of such sires must be capable of self-government. Mm -hmm. Writing two decades later on the eve of statehood, Prince laid the ground for the tricultural myth. He described New Mexico's population as, quote, different nationalities and forms of civ civilization, the Aboriginal and the Pueblo being one, the Spanish and the Mexican being another, and the American. He went on to describe the three groups portraying both the Pueblo people and the Mexican Americans as having static, unchanging customs. They existed in stark contrast to the American villages, which he described as, quote, full of nervous energy and the well-known characteristics of modern Western life. In short, Indians and Hispanics were trapped in their quaint past, while Anglos and other European Americans would lead the new state into the progress-filled future. The allure of the tricultural myth, then and now, I would contend, is threefold. First, it emphasizes cultural difference rather than racial hierarchy. Second, it features group harmony, displacing the complex history of conflict among various groups that we've heard about in these two wonderful presentations. And finally, the tricultural myth implicitly explains the cause of inequality as deserved. That is, Anglos are better off economically because of their future-oriented culture, whereas Indians and Mexican Americans are economically disadvantaged due to their cultural deficits, stunted because they cling to their traditions, not because the, of the structures of racial and class stratification. And I would submit this, this is pretty much how we still think about it today. Okay, how am I on time? Okay, okay. Okay, so um, I am now gonna move to my, my uh, concluding remarks on remembering and forgetting past traumas. Let me suggest that our forgetfulness about the 1847 revolt is a natural outgrowth of a desire to remember the American colonization as welcome rather than unwanted, as bloodless rather than violent. In the tricultural myth, the Indians, Mexican, Mexicans, and Anglos of New Mexico have found a narrative that has allowed us to get along in the 20th century, that allowed us to get along in the 20th century, 
but it rests on a collective suppression of the deep conflict among the three, three groups and also within the groups. Conflict that is historic to be sure, but that it also exists in the present. Although these old wounds come open from time to time, such as during the recent debates here about changing the name of Kit Carson Park, mostly we shuffle along amnesiacs who can't bear to reckon with the past. Consider how Americans have handled other historical traumas. We have yet to enact nationwide reparations for slavery. Congress did pass legislation apologizing for the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, including awarding $20,000 in reparations to each living person who was interned. Congress enacted a resolution apologizing for the American colonization of Hawaii a few years ago. But none of these relate to what happened here in New Mexico, right? There's been no movement from within New Mexico at the national level to recognize some of these, these wrongs. And by and large, our nation has not had a history of reckoning with the past, of taking the past seriously and grappling with it in the present. For example, South Africa and Germany have followed very different routes in that respect. What is the right approach for Taos in connection with the 1847 revolt, the American army's destruction of so many at the church at Taos Pueblo, and the treason trials that resulted in the hangings? That is not for me to say. But I will say that we ignore our history at our peril. Even if we repress it, our history rears its head repeatedly. The conflicts of the past don't so much stay in the past as bubble up in unexpected ways. The tricultural myth of New Mexico that arose as a way to smooth over the violence and contestation of the American takeover of the region, which was so deeply felt here in Taos, persists more than a century later. It keeps us from reckoning with our past and charting a new route in, in the 21st century in which all groups in New Mexico will have opportunities for equality. Thank you. <laughs>